It is the first week-ish of September and I wanted to do a quick update on the corn. I thought it was worth talking about what kind of selection it's useful to do in your cornfield right around now. So basically we have ears that have formed and all of the tassels have finished shedding pollen and actually right in front of us we can see one of the things that I find most important to select against or to select for tolerance of is this disease right here which is this is classic northern leaf blight lesions you can see the lesion is kind of well they say it's canoe shaped and if you can see this is like a lesion that's merged together but like if you look at these lesions here they're sort of narrow and longer parallel with the leaf and with the, the midrib but they kind of come to sort of a rounded point like the shape of a canoe and this is northern leaf blight and it is by far the most serious foliar disease that I have in uh, my corns. And so what happens is the lesions sort of expand on the leaf's tissue until they kind of merge and, you know, kill the entire leaf. So <clears throat> what you're selecting for is plants that have evidence of, you know, less severe symptoms than other plants. And the problem with northern leaf blight and the issue with selecting against northern leaf blight is it doesn't start to really show symptoms until right after anthesis, which is right after the pollen has already been shed. And so all of your uh, kernels for the season are already in production and all of the fertilization of the kernels has been produced before you can actually get a sense of the resistance and or tolerance for northern leaf blight. And so what you have to do is select for the female parents that are showing the most resistance. So what I do is basically I go along and through the planting at this time of year when you still have live plants and so you're able to assess their ability to, you know, resist northern leaf blight. And so severely affected plants, like I would call both of these severely affected. They've got leaves right up to the ear leaf that are showing multiple lesions that are like growing together. So then what I do is like, since I wanna keep the plant, is I just remove the tassel. And that's a signal to myself later in the season when I'm coming through and um, looking for uh, seed ears I'm gonna look for plants that still have their tassels. So anything that's had the tassel clipped off, I know I down checked it earlier in the season for one reason or another. So like here's a, here's a leaf that's showing a lot of northern leaf blight, right? These haven't grown together, but this leaf is two leaves above the ear. So definitely, you know, you're just sort of going on averages, you know, and you're looking at you know picking out the best plants available and there's a lot as you can see there's a lot of northern leaf blight in this planting um it is my worst foliar disease there are other diseases in the field here um there's rust and we can see a little bit of rust here on this leaf that's some rust it's, the symptoms are not severe. We don't get rust until much later and it never really takes off. I think by the time we start to get rust inoculum blowing up from down south, it's usually so, it's usually cooler and it's not the best conditions for rust to like really take off. But rust is a very, there's two versions of rust and they're, they're a pretty severe disease under certain con symptoms. And I like to have rust resistance uh, in the planting and it's something that I think we may be selecting more for uh, in the future but as climate change you know becomes more severe we're more likely to see more rust earlier in the season so 
definitely it's good to have rust resistance. So here's your classic northern leaf blight lesion. So here is the Tarahumara golden crystallino corn, which I got from Native Seed Search. So this corn is showing two different weird behaviors that corns will sometimes show you. It's got a very long ear shank. So the shank starts down here at this node and is going up, 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 about 18 inches before you get to the base of the ear, okay? So here's the ear inside this stretch to about right here. So you have an 18 inch long shank, which is bizarrely long. And then the other thing it's doing, is you can see it's got two more ears, ear shoots, shooting off the side on the nodes of the shank. And these are called, that is a condition called ear proliferation. And it's a really annoying habit that some corns have. And this one actually managed to produce a very small nub and ear down here. Doesn't feel like this one has anything in it. So basically what you've got with ear proliferation, and there, it's not always this extreme. A lot of times it'll look, uh, here's one over here. This is what you'll see a lot of times. You'll see, here's your main ear, and then you've got these little noses of secondary ear shoots poking out of the husks around. So there's one, is that one? No, there's two proliferated ears. And there won't be anything at the base of this. This will just be like a little secondary dried up, you know, like mini cob with no kernels on it. But ear proliferation is kind of an annoying trait that a lot of corns from tropical regions will do. And uh, it's something to select for, but it's really hard to get rid of completely. Uh, and it's just a waste of energy as far as I'm concerned. And then the super long shoots, I feel like that's kind of just a sign that the plant is a little bit confused. So this Tarahumara corn is from, you know, northern Mexico. And even though I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tarahumara corn some more, even though it's... Uh, done really well for me here and I'm going to say all the things that I like about this corn. Um, I think when you move it so far away from where it's normally adapted, sometimes the corns get a little bit confused when they're getting different signals from the photo period and the temperature and the light and water conditions that they're used to and they're adapted to. And so sometimes you get some funky behaviors and I've noticed like long ear shoots are one of the funky behaviors. And once you start crossing that into your corns that are adapted, that the, the long ear shoots like don't bother me because they go away. Like, and I don't think that this is the kind of behavior that the corn would show in Mexico under normal conditions because this is a stupid thing for a corn to do because you have any kind of a bird land on this, this is just gonna snap right off. You know, it's it's a because the center of gravity of the ear puts a lot of leverage at the base of the shoot, you know, so it's just not a useful behavior. And I don't think anybody would select for a corn with long shoots like this. Um, and most of it is not showing that. Like here's a, a Tarahumara right next to it that is not doing the long shoots at all. And I would say just a couple of them did this proliferation. This this particular plant was, you know, really weird and did a lot of weird things. But so let me just really quickly talk about this Tarahumara Golden Cristalino because it it was kind of like I wasn't sure about it putting it in this year um, because I'm I'm a little unimpressed with native seed search on the whole. Like and like if you look at their uh, listing of corns, they have a whole bunch of quote unquote Tarahumara corns that they call a bunch of bizarre names like Tarahumara uh, Tushpeño and Tarahumara Conico and all kinds of stuff. And those names are kind of clearly names that they've made up and given the corns. Those are not names that I would say the Tarahumara people 
you know, refer to those corns full. I would love it if Native Seed Search would actually, you know, provide, you know, meaningful amounts of information about the corns that they're growing, but I, I kind of, whatever, you know, and then I'm also kind of ticked off at Native Seed Search over the whole glass gem nonsense, and uh, I still have a deep anger about the way that they contributed to that, you know, scam, basically. Uh, but anyway, this corn is awesome. And I'm gonna now list all of the things that I like so much about this corn. One of the things you'll notice is this corn, on average, is the ears are already drying down. And if you'll remember from an earlier video, this was the first corn to tassel and silk of any of the corns in the patch. And they are also, of course, the first corns to dry down. But the other thing I'm noticing, they're also, if you'll notice, very dark green, which kind of tells me, in comparison to the rest of my corn, which kind of tells me they are really good at harvesting, you know, nutrients from the soil. They are very aggressively competing in the soil for uh, plant nutrients, which is impressive and pleasant to see. And also the fact that these and it's also a very, very quick, very early corn. And despite the fact that it's from, you know, northern desert Mexico, it is, I would say, surprisingly well adapted to here, my climate here in the northeast. Like this corn grew like crazy and it has produced really nice ears. These ears are not completely, completely mature, but they are basically mature enough to harvest. So let me just pop one out and show it to you. Um, trying to do this left-handed, excuse me. And I can't say this, this is a nice ear, okay? For as quick and early as this corn was, this is a very healthy, satisfying amount of corn to be produced by a plant that's this early and, you know, fast maturing. And uh, they're very flinty. This one isn't completely dried down. I've got a couple that I've already harvested in the house. Let's do another one. Let's do this guy. This guy's pretty well. But, okay, so one thing to notice. See, the ear is drying down and the corn is still very green and leafy. And that's a trait, here's, just to point out, this is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of rust. This is rust. But one thing, on average, there's very little northern leaf blight on this Tarahumara. See, look at that. These are low down leaves, okay, and that's basically zero northern leaf blight. Not zero, but... So, one of the things that I've discovered about this corn that is just, you know, rocking my world is it is highly, highly tolerant to northern leaf blight, at least under my conditions. That's freaking awesome. And really, there's, there's very little that you can find about the northern leaf blight tolerance level of a corn it's just not something that uh, the seed companies will tell you about. But if you live in the Northeast, look at that, beautiful. So, whoop, dropped it. Lefty, one-handed. That's a gorgeous ear of corn for a corn this early. I am really, really stoked about this Tarahumara. This is going to be a major addition to my flint corn project. So here's some more of these Tarahumara ears. Um, really nice, mostly 10 row. Really happy with this corn. And then this is a cob that I saved from a few years ago just to show the super long shanks that you can get sometimes. So there's the cob. This is Kuroiko, I think. Really long. Here's more shank, more shank. So yeah, that's what sometimes happens. Corn will go crazy. But yeah, thanks a lot for watching.